So now that you know a little bit about what a layering, layering is as an abstraction, let's talk about a codification of this abstraction in the form of something called the layers architectural pattern. So this concept is so pervasive, the concept of layering, especially in computer systems, that someone actually took the time to document it in the form of a pattern. And this is actually called an architectural pattern. So what is an architectural pattern first? So an architectural pattern is a structural organizational schema for software systems that provides a set of predefined subsystems, specifies their responsibility and responsibilities, and then includes rules and guidelines for organizing the relationships between these roles. That's what an architecture pattern is, architectural pattern is in general. And you can uh, read more about this in the Pattern Oriented Software Architecture book series, in particular volume one, where it talks about what architectural patterns are. The, archi the layers architectural pattern, which is an architectural pattern, has been described in a couple different places. It appears in the POSA 1 book, and then it also appears in the POSA 4 book. I was a co-author for po POSA 4. This contains about 100 and 13 short descriptions of patterns that are all organized to describe sort of a big picture view of how to write uh, distributed computing services and applications. The layers pattern structures software applications and infrastructure, usually combining them together, in a couple of different ways. And you can see here, this is sort of a nice diagram that illustrates layering as a software architecture style or pattern. And what it does is it partitions the overall system into groups of subtasks or services. And as you can see here, uh, these services are exposed through some kind of functional interface. And it doesn't have to be, I mean, they're usually methods or functions or something. Uh, and so what you can see here is that things in, say, layer C, depend on stuff in layer B, and stuff in layer B depends on stuff in layer A. So that's a nice layered design. You can also see a couple other interesting things here. Things in layer C can actually bypass stuff in layer B and go directly to layer A if they want to. So you have to decide whether that's acceptable or not. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And then within a given layer, the subtasks are organized in various ways. And so you can see the, um, uh, we take the level, we take the groups of subtasks and then we arrange them in these different layers. And you have an interface, which is this part, and then you have an implementation, which is not visible to the layers above, but which is implemented using the services or subtasks from the layers, the layer, or maybe the layers below. So the purpose of this stuff is to try to simplify software development and evolution. In particular, the goal is to try to take a tightly coupled big ball of mud, which is what you have if you don't use layering, where you might have hundreds of functions just all sort of floating around in this general uh, namespace. And rather than organizing your software like this, which is really tedious and error prone and complicated, instead you have this modular solution that can be extended and contracted more easily. Because rather than trying to program to this, you can think of things in a nice, nice neat, orderly manner, where you've got the uh, concept of, of different families of applications and families of services that can be added to in a systematic way. You can remove stuff. You can add stuff. We'll talk in a second about kind of the benefits and pros and cons of this, but that's the basic idea visually. One of the things you need to be careful of when you use layering is to avoid unnecessary overhead when moving between the layers. And uh, the general rule of thumb is, as much as possible, try to make the interlayer communication fast. And the typical way of doing that would be to arrange it to just be good old function calls. Um, one of the things you sometimes have to be careful of is not organizing each of your layers to be a domain crossing or process or computer crossing boundary. So if it turns out that layer, the functions in layer C are 
running on a different machine from the functions in layer B, and the functions in layer B are running on a different process or a different machine from the functions in layer A, then there's going to be a lot of overhead moving back and forth between the layers. Now, sometimes that's unavoidable. That's the purpose of having a cluster-based system in many cases. But it's not always that case. So if your goal is performance, then you have to think carefully about how to optimize the layering. And the purpose of this is to avoid excessive context switching, synchronization, data copying, data management overhead. And uh, it's a bit beyond the scope of this discussion to go into that in detail, but my whole PhD focused on this. So if you're bored, you can read that. So that's just a quick overview of the layers architecture pattern. Obviously, there's more to it. We'll talk about that in a second, but that gives you sort of a high-level view of layering as a, as a style of writing software to decouple things and separate concerns so it's easier to understand the whole piece.